the religious aspects of Christmas celebrations appear to be on the decline. A 2017 study from the Pew Research Center showed Religious aspects of Christmas celebrations appear to be on the decline. A 2017 study from the Pew Research Center shows that 46% of Americans celebrate Christmas primarily as a religious holiday. Now that's down from 51% back in 2013. The most Reverend Michael Curry, you remember him, is a presiding bishop of the Episcopal Church. He first made headlines in May when he delivered a rousing sermon at Prince Harry and Meghan Markle's royal wedding. He joins us today with the true meaning of Christmas here in the studio. Bishop Curry, we welcome you. Thank you. You believe that the message of Christmas is really all about love. Mm -hmm. It really is. Isn't it, that hard these days when we're living in a nation that's so patri that's so um, vitriolic and so mean mm -hmm. and so hateful? Mm -hmm. You still say, hold on to love. Mm -hmm. Hold on uh, to it. Yeah. Hold on to it because it's all we got. Um, the truth is, if love is just a sentiment, then, then it doesn't matter. But love is a commitment. And one of the passages that speaks about Christmas is John 3.16. It speaks about the crucifixion of Jesus, but it also speaks about Christmas. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Yeah. It is love which is tied to giving, not taking. Mm -hmm. Giving. We give gifts as a symbolic way of reminding us that God showed us the way of love, which is to give and not mm -hmm. to count the cost. You said hold on to love because that's all we got. It's all we Elaborate got. Elaborate on that. I, if you'd asked me years ago, what's the opposite of love? I probably would have said immediately hate. Hate, yeah. And then to be sure, that's that's part of it. But the real opposite of love is selfishness. Love is the opposite of self-centeredness. And self-centeredness is the most destructive force in human relationships and political ones. But love is the antidote. Love is the cure. Love is the way. Well, I think the cure and the antidote is what many people need. But how do we do that when we are so polarized in the nation today? I think that's where we have to make a decision and a commitment. That's why I say love is not just and we're mad too. Yeah, but make a commitment. I'm going to live in the most loving way possible today. If I'm a member of Cong Congress, I'm going to live in the most loving way possible and I'm going to look for legislation that is about loving the neighbor. Mm -hmm. That is not about my self-interest, but about the common good. That's what love looks like in political relationships, in economic arrangements, in business, in commerce, and in daily life. And that kind of unselfish, sacrificial love is a game changer in all, all sorts of life. It has been quite a year for you. We saw you at Meghan and Harry's wedding. Mm -hmm. Then I saw you at the funeral of President H.W. Bush. What stands out for you? 
Well, you know, um, in all honesty, on both occasions at the funeral of President Bush, the word love recurred over and over and over again. It did. Um, and at that wedding, I mean, the truth is, it was wonderful. Um, the truth is, we kind of all showed up, two big of us showed up to watch two people tell the rest of us that they love each other. No, that was a standout line for me. And I'm very curious about you because you have had quite a year, but I was reading and you had two very big major, uh, many mm -hmm. people didn't know you before that day, mm -hmm. that you actually still get nervous. You're an eloquent speaker. You know what you're going to talk about. What are you nervous about? I have no Can't idea, but I'm just Lord? nervous. Well, I do call on the Lord, but yeah. I just want to but make sure he shows up. <laughs> what are you nervous about? Oh, you get nervous. Bef I get nervous before, but once I'm in the moment, then then I'm focused. Then you get in the zone and you just kind of keep going. But I get nervous because you don't want to mess up. No. I mean, there I was at the wedding, two billion people. I didn't even want to scratch my nose. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you didn't. So as we head into 2019, other than love, what do you want us to remember? What I really want us to remember is that there's one God who created all of us. And if all of us have the same parent, that means we are brothers and sisters, siblings of each other. Mm -hmm. And we need to treat each other and treat this creation like we are brothers and sisters. We need to remind it of that. You can't get that message enough. So nice to meet you. It's Thank great you to meet you. very much for coming today. Thank you. God bless you. God bless you too, Bishop Curry. <laughs> In a crowded subway car, they're usually not easy to spot. You haven't seen any police yet today? No, maybe I didn't pay attention. Little did this rider know she was sitting right next to a plainclothes officer. On this day, Lauren Garcia blends in with jeans, sneakers, and a shopping bag. Especially like if when I walk up to people, they're like taken aback. Oh my gosh, you're a cop? Garcia is actually one of six plainclothes cops on this subway car, heading from Brooklyn to Canal Street in Manhattan. All members of the NYPD's anti-crime team in Transit District 30 in downtown Brooklyn. We're going to be looking in particular for what you have in your hands. It's one of the NYPD's special units that targets specific suspects and specific problem spots in the subways, working to prevent and fight crime. We recently got an exclusive inside look at their work. We have our recidivists for our robberies, for our grand larcenies, for our swipers. Our swipers are people that are offering uh, swipes for sale. Across the city, transit crime is down about 3%. Sex crimes like groping or public lewdness, however, are up by 29%. Police attribute that to more victims now choosing to come forward. Robberies across the board have plunged about 9%. Police attribute that in large part to plainclothes work. You have your vest on underneath. I have the vest on, I have a gun, uh, handcuffs. Lieutenant Michael Kuchusko dressed as a construction worker. They also disguise themselves as MTA workers or headphone wearing riders, looking distracted but secretly watching everything, even from behind station doors. Someone may be here trying to rob someone and so forth, so it's a lot of things that you can actually see. The busiest time of day for this anti-crime team is actually during business hours. The busiest time of year for NYPD Transit as a whole is actually coming up, the holiday season. Someone who, who last month was reading a book on a train now is going to have an expensive item next time. Police are reminding riders, especially shoppers, to be alert and pay attention. Chances are plainclothes cops on your car or platform will be doing the same. And Chief Joe Fox told me many people don't even know they're crime victims until sometimes hours later when they finally realize something was stolen. And Christina Maurice, these are plain clothes versus undercover cops. There's a difference. The NYPD was okay with us showing their faces. They look like anybody else. They do, like London. you and me. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andrea. Yeah. All right, I want y'all to understand that this is the most hated show in the black corner of the internet. They sit here to make sure that I can't be heard. I don't know what it is that I'm saying that you don't want heard. But anyway, we're going to get on with the show. Welcome to the Black Minds News. I'm your host, the Whiteologist, Mr. Blows Your Mind. This show here is to, to translate, to communicate, to articulate, to relate, to decode, to unveil, to spread the news, whether it be by news, website, uh, publications, quotes, doesn't matter because I'm going to pull it from wherever I get it. As I articulate these information, I ask that the creator of the universe be here, present, mind, soul, and spirit. As a descendant of the greatest people who created what they call the greatest country on this side, they call it the Western Hemisphere, 
We give them honor over here because the truth don't need no partner. And you know what my motto is? I ain't going to tell you what I heard. I'm going to tell you what I know. Now, I know you're sitting up in here, right? That's what you do. It's, it's funny how, again, let's just take the first clip. The first clip was the bishop, right? The bishop said how this so-called holiday, right, this holiday that everybody celebrates is about love. And it's about putting the transgressions away that you have animosity with other people, especially when you done did them wrong. I'm going to say that again. Especially when you done did them wrong. See, you hide behind the guise of your mechanisms and your institutions when you do a lot of dirt. And then you don't want nobody to say nothing to you because it hurts your little fragile mind. It hurts your fragile spirit. But the truth going to be told whether it's by me or anybody else. Because see, the thing is, while the truth don't need no partner, all that that you lie, uh, you have to face the inevitable. I'm going to say that again. You have to face the inevitable. So you can do what you do to make yourself feel secure in your own self. But the inevitable, you all, we all face. So you trying to shut me out to keep me from what I'm doing. <laughs> well... You could do that. But it only shows the character of you, right? So anyway, let's get to the show, y'all. I'm not going to let that stop from what I'm doing unless they do it in opening, right? They have to do it in open front of y'all if they're going to do it, right? So anyway, let's get it in. So, again, there's that bishop, the one who was the one who took care of the wedding where everybody got all, you know, Feeling certain ways about when they seen the so-called royal wedding, right? Oh, so many people, especially black people. A lot of black women got, oh, we got a black person in the... Uh, see, that's what happens. See, when you start telling the truth and make people have to look at things for what it is, those people who know what they're doing don't want that to be heard. They don't want you to be... They don't want that to be disseminated. They want to keep you in a per perpetual mind of... Stupidity. That's why when you go places, other places around the world, most people look at you according to the way how you deal. Because again, you have gotten the pot lick of people who has a country and then they assimilate with their debot <laughs> debauchery, right? And then they make you become as low as them, right? So here's a holiday that a lot of you just celebrate for the whole lot of money. You know, they don't want me talking. See, I don't, I don't, I don't. I don't participate. I separate from anything that you do, right? I want no dealing of you, period, right? You know who you really are. Yeah, I know you're trying to make everybody seem like, oh, you come up with all kinds of terms to try when somebody's against you, when we are the bears of what y'all have done. And you don't want to hear it? That's just too bad because you ain't going to never be able to change the truth. You can change the truth. You can rewrite history. You can do all that stuff. You can rearrange people. You can kill people off. But you got the faith. You. Remember, that's a that's a solo act. You have to be before that inevitable. Right? So those who are doing their job are going to do their job. Again, as them scriptures say, you can kill the body, but you cannot kill that who gives the spirit and the soul. You keep that in mind. Keep cutting the mic. You keep doing all that behind the scenes, making it, doing all that stuff that you do because you don't want it to be heard. It's obvious that you're keeping me suppressed, right? It's obvious, right? Again, y'all, this is the most hated show in the black corner internet. Now, let's get to the show. I'm not going to, I'm, I'm done with that. They hear, you hear me, send it back to your boss. I'm saying it, right? Now, it is the season to be broke, right? You went in, you spend all this stuff to show a symbolism, a symbolism of your appreciation, your love, right? Then forgot what the whole creation supposedly that you've been inculcated in your mind to believe what the holiday is about. You don't see the, the Nazarene story, the Nativity story anymore. You don't even see Santa Claus anymore, right? Other than if you out and you sing somebody jingling the bell and asking for more money, right? So that is a time where, again, if you are into criminality, this is the time for you to be looking because people was definitely going to have something worthy to take. 
<laughs> so you see New York went out and they started putting undercover people out there because again they looking for again again it's like quarter time right it'd be like quarter times with a ticket you're out there driving about you see all the police pulling everybody you know they're out there getting quota to get tickets because see if, if it's all about really law and order and if everybody's obeying then guess what you can't pay judges police and lawyers because everybody doing what's supposedly right so a holiday that is filled with nothing but nothing but gifts and people got money and boy, this is probably the time. And that's what happened. So they had to put the kind of securities out there because, again, those this is the time to be getting robbed. You know, everybody that didn't, hopefully you didn't get robbed, right? And so everything just kind of went on about this business and doing what it do. Now, as the bishop said about love, again, being the DOS of this land, being the... You know, descendant of that and the perpetualness that, co that continues that everybody want to act like the elephant ain't in the room. Well, let's take that, this whole holiday thing, right? Let me show you this, right? Let me show you this, right? So let's say again, people will say they do things in the spirit of giving Christmas cherry, right? You would not expect to see racism in that, right? You would not expect that. You would assume that everybody, because it's about, you know, what you've been programmed to believe that it's associated is, it's about the Messiah being born, the baby in the manger, right? And all that, but God so gave the world his only begotten son, right? That whole stuff, right? And so people take this time again, this is a family again, master give everybody a day off, right? You get a chance to sit down and eat with, see what people, this is the only time, right? This is how you keep getting inculcated into it, right? Because again, you just paid a lot. Why wouldn't he give you a day off when you done spent a lot anyway, right? All that food everybody done bought, all them alcohol you done bought, all them gifts you done bought, all them plane tickets, right? It's just saturated with capital, right? So, certain people have certain traditions. Now, everybody don't do this. Certain people do this. Now, I want you to look at when I play this. Watch it. Just watch this right quick and we shall be right back. Check this out. Uh, hopefully, everything going to see. So, what you seen there is a tradition that they call, right, the polar bear plunge, right, they call the polar bear plunge, right, and what happens is they tr they do this traditionally as something that goes back to, uh, you can't really find the origin of it, you, you just, just cannot find the origin of it, right, right, you can't find the origin of it, because again, uh, you know, some things they don't really want you to know, but again, it's supposed to be for charity, right? Again, that's great. That's great that you go out there and people who are, you know, in need, like Special Olympics, I think go over to cop and cops used to go in there and plunge and starve the cop. At least in one state it might have been. I don't, again, the hardest part is finding the history to that, right? So here it is. You have this segment of society. People who do this. Normally it's no new, new Year's, but sometimes they do it again. You know, it's a holiday. So they all off again, like everybody master give off and master children get to have some fun. They call it fun festival, right? So they go out there and they jump in the frigid cold water 
as a test of their, you know, bravery. And, and again, can you do it? And, and you know, it's for charity, and that's good, and that's fine. All right, now, now again, I'm going to play this one more time for you to see this. Because I want you to see, did you see what I seen? Right? Let me do it one more time. Let me see if I can find, let me see where it said. Hold on. Let me see. Uh, let's see. Wait a minute. What did I do with that? Huh? Uh, let's see. Wow, that, that just disappeared, didn't it? Okay. Well, we don't need to do it. How about I do this? Okay, so. First, let me look at the odds, make sure. Because am I getting the echoes or are y'all getting it clear? Is it clear? Is everything good? No sound? Still no sound? Okay, let me know right now. Somebody give me a one if there's a sound or not. <laughs> the most hated show on the black corner of the internet. That's what I am. Can I be heard? What's good, Kabir? If you can hear me, what's good, brother? Leonard DeYuda, can you hear sound now? And Angela Barron, what's good, sister? Anybody give me a one? Let me know if you, I can be heard. Still no sound? No, still no sound? All right, let me check something. I can check again. Hold on. Let me see. So y'all a little slow at it. Right? Y'all a little slow at that. So I'm going to have to go to my own sources. All right. Go back in there, check and see if it's all good. All right. All right. I won't go forward until I make sure y'all heard this, right? All right. So let's see. Yeah, you know. Ain't that something, huh? Everybody got their truth, but you can't speak your truth, huh? Uh, you can't speak your truth, right? All right, so let's see. All right, let's see. Can I can I be heard? Can I be heard? Test it, test it. One, two, three. Okay. All right, so y'all can't hear me. All right, good. Now, again, you seen them do the polar run, right? Now I want you to see this. Now you see what you seen, but again, you didn't see everything that you thought you seen, because again. Of course, they always do it in the subliminal. Do it in the sneaky way. And then they'll act as if like, oh, no, see, you're just making that up. No, no, no. Let me show you. Did you see this cat? Did you see him? Did you see him? Did y'all see him? Because you said with all them people out there, you just knew there couldn't have been nobody black out there, right? But did you see that cat? Did you see him? I got him circled. Can you see him? Can you see him? <laughs> right? They tried to sneak it all past Mr. White Allergies. You couldn't sneak that past me. I seen it. Right? Right? Now, isn't that something, right? Look at that. What is, why would this white man want to get himself pitch black and run through doing that? What, what, what is that symbol like? What is it? A little, sub, huh? Is that that little sneaking punch? Huh? The old N word? Huh? Well, you say, well, Mr. Blake, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're overlooking this. That's not, that's not what it was. It's just a guy. It just looked like he's black. That's just a shadow. I, I can't see a white person being that black. Right? So, uh, let me see again. Well, then the only two black things that out there was this. How about this? Did you see that? Did y'all even peep that too? The dog in that shadow thing. With the hat, right? Everything out there is Caucasian white other than that black dog and this individual right here, right? Oh, they snuck it past. It went by real quick. You couldn't have seen it. If I was to replay it again, you might catch it, right? But, you know, we always make it up. Racist again. Uh, you makes that up, Mr. Blows. Your mind is always. You no, know, you just makes that up. But see, we're wrong if we talk about how you keep perpetuating your hatred, but we're supposed to act like you're not doing it. Not over here. Huh? Now, I don't know what your truth is, but I know what my truth is. And my truth is, when I see it, I'm going to say something. I'm going to expose it. Then stop doing it if you don't want nobody talking about it, right? But again, in the spirit of what is probably good and holy and all this, but you're still doing stuff like this. Right? You're still doing it. You just can't. You can't resist the opportunity. Huh? You just can't resist the opportunity no matter where it is. Right? So again, 
Did y'all hear this too? So let me go ahead and play this and uh, come we back. We begin though with more fallout hold over on, that high on, school wrestler on. forced to cut his oh, hair yeah, before yeah, a well, wrestling they, match. Huh? Oh. Yeah, they just, I mean, wow, huh? I mean, wow. The, the 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 show going out your way to make sure little old channel like mine's right little old channel like mine's huh? you don't went and got it out thought I had went and paid and got all these people you, you got you you were stealing you was just stealing subscribers just to be doing it but that you had to take almost two thousand away right but yeah the kid get past two three and if you slipped up let me get out a little bit I got over three hundred he said no put his ass back right. <laughs> Boy, I tell you, y'all some funny people. I know you think y'all who you but you're funny. That's why you don't, you know I know. You know I know. But anyway, check this out, y'all. Moving forward. And again, I want to thank uh, subscribers in the house. What's good, fam? Pass it by us. Hey, hit that like button, subscribe button, dislike. Put a comment saying I'm BS, right? Agents, we ain't got to talk about it. It is what it is with you, so let's get it going. We didn't know with more fallout over that high school wrestler forced to cut his hair before a wrestling match. Outrage over a decision that many are calling outright racist. ABC's Adrian Banker joins us now, and Adrian, an investigation is now underway. That's right, Amy. Good morning to you. A spokesperson with the New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association says all groups and teams have agreed not to assign this referee to any event until further notice. This morning, there's mounting outrage over this video taken at a New Jersey wrestling match. It shows high school junior Andrew Johnson getting his dreadlocks cut off just before competing. The referee allegedly tells Johnson he would forfeit the match if he didn't submit to the haircut. The young wrestler appears visibly upset as his locks are shorn. A teammate is seen trying to console him. Now the state's Division of Civil Rights is launching an investigation. The video has created a firestorm on social media. Many call the episode racist. Oscar-nominated director Ava DuVernay tweets, To watch this young man's ordeal wrecked me. New Jersey's governor also weighing in, saying he was deeply disturbed, adding, No student should have to needlessly choose between his or her identity and playing sports. Olympic wrestling gold medalist Jordan Burroughs says that referees are supposed to meet with both teams about an hour before the competition. He checks each wrestler on each team to make sure that they're in accordance with whatever rules would apply when they're out there on the mat. And so for him to allow for this wrestler to come to the mat and have his hair cut mat side is something that I've never seen before. According to the school district superintendent, the referee decided Johnson's hair length and headgear violated regulations. That referee, Alan Maloney, has been benched while state officials investigate the matter. On Facebook, the teen's mother writes, he is good now, but that was brutal, emotionally and physically. In the end, Johnson won his match in overtime. Now, according to a report by the per, uh, Cur Courier Post, Maloney made racial comments toward an African-American referee back in 2016, though Maloney told the paper he did not remember using the offensive word, but believed the accounts of witnesses who told him he said it. The video of this young man having his hair cut has been viewed around 12 million times. It is times. hard to watch and hard to imagine there wasn't another option. All right, Adrian, thank you. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. The religious aspects of Christmas celebrations appear to be on the decline. A 2017 study. All right, y'all. So, again, like I said, I got so much technical difficulties going on at the same time. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually give you the story that came out today based on that. But first, let me pull this up first. Thank you for y'all patience. You know how it is. Those who are familiar with how it goes over here, you know, right? So, let me pull up and give you the story of what it was said. Put it up on your screen first, right? And uh, this is, it says here, it says, family, a black wrestler who was forced to cut his dreadlocks speak out, right? You know, I'm going to say that again. Family, a black wrestler who was forced to cut his dreadlocks speak out. This story was done today 
December the 26th, 2018, and from the CNN, and this is how it reads. The partner or the parents of the 16-year-old black varsity wrestler who was forced to cut his dreadlocks before a match has spoken out for the first time since the incident. Charles and Rosa Johnson speaking through their attorney, Dominic A. Spazila, said in a Monday statement that the conduct of the referee who forced their son, Andrew, Andrew to cut his hair, appears more egregious as additional information comes to light. They allege that the referees was late to the meet and didn't question their son's hair or need for a head covering during the initial evaluation. The referee did not immediately respond to CNN's request for comment Tuesday afternoon. The referees later told Andrew his hair and his headgear were not in compliance with league regulations. Spagalli said in the statement, Andrew told the referee he could push his hair back, Spazelli said, but the referee refused because Andrew's hair wasn't in its natural state. So he gave an ultimatum, cut the locks or forfeit the match. Andrew chose to have his hair cut rather than forfeit the match, according to a letter from the school district superintendent David Capaccio, Jr. Videos of a trainer cutting Andrew's hair was with scissors in the middle of a gym quickly went viral on Friday after it was shared by a local reporter from South New Jersey today. The referee is behind them directing her to cut, cutting until he was satisfied with the length, Spazzati said in the statement. The wrestler won the match in a sudden victory in overtime according to the SNJ Today. Team wrestler with his hair prior to infamous match. They show a picture, which I didn't show, right? They, they had his hair, but it's kind of long, right, in his natural state. It says, Andrew Pan said in the statement that wrestling taught him to be resilient in the face of adversity. As we move forward, we are comforted by the, both the strength of Andrew's character and the support he received from the community, they said. The blame here rests primarily with the referee, Spazzali said in the statement, and those that permitted him to continue in that role despite clear evidence of what should have been a disqualifying race-related transgression. In previous matches in a tournament a week before, Spazzali said, Andrew wrestled without any issues. According to the NFHS wrestling rule book, a wrestler hair cannot fall below the top of a shirt collar in the back below his earlobe on the sides or below his eyebrows. It is longer than the rule allows. The wrestler has to braid his hair or hide it beneath a hair cover attached to his ear guard, the rule book states. The New Jersey State Interscholastic Athletic Association Executive Director Larry White said in a statement that state authorities are investigating the incident. The referee won't be assigned to moderate matches until the incident has been thoroughly reviewed, White said. Finally, as an African-American and parent, as well as a former educator, coach, official, and athlete, I clearly understand the issue at play and probably better than most, White added. In a statement Friday night, a spokeswoman from the Office of New Jersey Attorney General, Goober Gruwal, said in Civil Rights Division open investigation into the incident as part of a 2013 agreement with the NJSIAA to address potential bias in high school sports. Reactions from professional athletes. The video of Andrew getting his hair cut with scissors in the gym sparked outrage. Jordan Burroughs, a four-time world champion and 2012 Olympic champion wrestler, posted a thread on Twitter discussing how proud he was of Andrew and expressing his disgust at the situation. I've been wrestling for 25 years at every level and I have never once seen a person required to cut their hair during a match. Burrow tweeted, my opinion is that this was a combination of an abuse of power, racism, and just plain negligence. Burrow also commented on how Andrew's hair was part of his identity and that the coaches and parents of the Buena wrestling team should have done more to protect Andrew. Aljamain Sterling, a UFC fighter, also commented on the incident. Epitome of overdose on power, shaking my head. Glad the kid won the match after making such a sacrifice for whatever vendetta the ref had against him, the team or other reason that was not okay 
embarrassing his tweet read. Now, so we see that, uh, you know, the backlash has come, but the damage has already been done. Young man, again, junior in high school, some are saying he's somewhere between 15, 16, 16, 17, right? So 15 to 17. And being under the situation, love of the sport, again, we don't know what's attached to that maybe he's trying to get a scholarship, right? Uh, again, sometimes... Again, as, as it was said clearly in the, um, the article here, there was abuse of power. Again, there's a rule book that states about as to hair length from the side to the back, right? But again, it was the discretion of the referee. And obviously, his discretionary was to say, cut to my satisfaction, right? And so, again, for those who was of that... You know, ethnicity and hair, right? You know what it takes to do that. And then isn't it ironic that you've seen the image of that ref? Huh? He bald. He he ain't got no hair. He only got his shit around the side of his head. So, of course, he's going to have problems with seeing somebody with a full head of hair. You know what I'm saying? He got a complex. So, here was his opportunity to be at the abuse of his power. And again, the psychological damage, again, that would never go away with the young man. He's going to always remember that. But again, that can turn for the betterment later down. Because see, again, what ends up happening is when you start doing stuff like this to us when we're younger, you turn us on the course that again, we be towards you. We're fighting against the things you've done. It don't have to be a physical form fight, but it could be legislatively, being put in positions of office and all these things. Because again, you can't reverse and try to make it seem it's, it's us having the problem with you when it's always you got the problem with us. It's just like this channel here. You got problems with me because I bring about what is facts. Now, if you were to shut me down just to the fact that I'm doing something that would be that you say I'm just making stuff up, that would be different. But you don't want to hear what you look like. It's like the vampire, right? When Dracula goes across the... You already watched the movies, right? Dracula, when he go across the mirror, he don't see himself, right? So somehow we got to get Dracula to get a look at himself. huh? You need to look at yourself a little bit, and maybe that might change something about you. Whether it's too late anyway for that or not, the point is, the onus ain't going to fall on the victim. You understand? And that's the problem today. You always want to put the onus on the victim. No, you are the culprit. And you have to be accountable here or the inevitable. I say it again. Either here or the inevitable. Take your choice. Now, hopefully, again, the parents, again, once the investigation comes to full fruition, they will do the proper necessary things. And again, hopefully that is not the only job he got. Because if it is, you're going to find a new one, sir. Right? All right. So what else I got in my bag? Let's see. Let me look at the audience because I might not be. Is everything good? One, one. I hear you, brother. Okay. Thank uh, the person he's going against is portraying him, 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 him. All right. There you go. All right. So I'm good. I'm being heard. All right. So we're going to get it going again. All right. Now. So again, like I said, the theme is always it's about race. Right? People don't want to fess up to the fact of the matter. I, is, can we say, can we blanket and say everyone? No. But the problem is, even those who say they know still benefit and at times they shy away because again, the benefits that they get and you don't want to be ostracized by your own. Now, we may understand it, but again, we said, where's the sacrifice? Hmm? How is it again, again, I already shut this, that down, but I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So how is it that a gym full of people didn't feel to say, hey, man, wait a minute. Something ain't right with this. Here's your coach sitting there, assistant coach. He ain't no one ran, got the scissors. But no one, not even nobody whose parents, and I don't know how many you know, black people was in the audience, somebody should have been like, wait a minute, hold on, man. Ain't there another way they could do this? Can't you do something? But see, the thing was, it was under the discretion of the referee. He said he wanted to cut to his satisfaction. 
right? So he put the boy at the crossroad. Well, put the crossroad on his ass. All right, moving on. So, what we got here, right? So, again, as we talk about people not liking you, right? People were, smi the old, there was old songs, they smiling faces, smiling faces sometimes. They don't tell the truth, right? So, he's mad and okay, let's say, young man gets high, out of high school. Now, he goes to college, right? So, you know, for those who've been to college, right, you know, you, you get to the dorms or something again, right? And you get, you, I mean, if you got that kind of money, you might get your own private room, right? But otherwise, you might end up getting a, what? Roommate, right? So, let's say you get a roommate of an other ethnicity, right? And you say, well, you've been, y'all been dorming buddies for some time now. Then you feel like, well, we got some camaraderie. You know what I'm saying? Kind of, we kind of cool like that. You know what I'm saying? I stand. You know, sometimes you want you could drink some of this or eat some of that. And I, you know, what I'm saying he, I talked to his mom and all. You know what I'm saying? You kind of feel like we we kind of good, right? Then you come to find some stuff like this, huh? Then you come to find this out. Then you say, what? Okay, check this out, y'all. Be right back. Former student at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania is under arrest. Hold on, they're doing it to me again. Hold, 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 hold the horse, hold, hold, hold the press, hold the press. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. But that's what the truth do to you, right? That's what the truth do to you. As much as you think you like the truth, but you really don't like the truth. So let's do it again. One, two, three from the top. Let's hit it. Let's get Former it. student at Lehigh University in Pennsylvania is under arrest tonight, accused of slowly poisoning his roommate by lacing his milk and his mouthwash with a dangerous chemical. The two had been roommates for years. The victim saying he thought they were friends, but the poisoning isn't the only charge the suspect is now facing. Here's ABC's Alex Perez. A Lehigh University student is behind bars tonight after police say he had been trying to kill his roommate for several months. Prosecutors say 22-year-old Yu Kai Yang from China faces several charges including attempted homicide and aggravated assault. Authorities say the chemistry major carried out the attempted murder plot inside his dorm slowly and discreetly putting a poisonous metal known as thallium and possibly other chemicals in his roommate Juwan Royal's milk and mouthwash. Mr. Royal experienced extreme pain in his lower extremities as well as severe burning and numbness. Royal, who had been roommates with Yang for several years and thought they were friends, first reported his symptoms to police back in March, dizziness, shaking, and vomiting. That's when his blood tested positive for thallium. Back in April, Yang was arrested and released on bail for damaging Royal's television, bed, and desk, and writing, N-word, get out of here, in black marker. Tom, according to police, Yang told them he bought the poisonous chemical but planned to use it on himself if he didn't do well on exams. Royal is said to be recovering but still suffering from side effects. Tom? Alex Perez on that disturbing case tonight. All right, Alex, thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching. All right. So... Let me go on here and pull up the article for that one. As you just seen what you just seen there, right? And it got me working, working like a mug, right? <laughs> just be a little patient with me, y'all. Because, uh, you know, that's what we have to do over here, right? Um, when you're the most hated show in the black corner of the internet, you know, it's always going to be something. So let's see if I can get the... Let me get the, the picture up there. I can't get the article up there. I know I got the article up there, right? Hold on. Let me pull it up so you can see. Uh, let's see. Uh, no, that's not it. All right. So I'm not sure what happened to that. But again, I'll just read the article as I find it. i pull it up. Okay. So the gears, it says, former Lehigh University student charged with poisoning roommate. You know I'm going to say that again. 
Former Lehigh University student charged with poisoning roommate. This comes from NBC News. And this is how it reads. Former Lehigh University college student accused earlier this year of leaving racist graffiti for his roommate in their dorm room is now facing charges he tried to poison him. I don't know how you say tried though. Yukai Yang, 22, an international student from China, turned himself in on Thursday and was charged with attempt homicide, aggravated assault, simple assault, and reckless endangerment. Northampton County District Attorney John Morganelli said Thursday. The chemistry major allegedly sickened his roommate, Jawan Royal, 22, over a few months with small amounts of thallium and possibly other chemicals. Morgan Alley said at the press conference, thallium is toxic metal that is colorless, odorless, and tasteless and can be fatal if consumed. Initially, Mr. Royal was dumbfounded by this as everyone else because he believed they had a fairly cordial relationship as roommates, Sister District Attorney Abe Cassis said. Royal told police at the Bethlehem, Pennsylvania campus that in February, he drank from a water bottle in his room and felt burning in his mouth. Yang allegedly mixed the chemical, chemicals into his roommate's food, drink, and mouthwash. Royal became ill multiple times in March and his symptoms were included dizziness, shaking, and vomiting. Became progressively worse, Morgan Gelly said, Roy's blood tested positive for the chemical and was treated for thallium poisoning. Yang was confronted about Roy's sickness in a follow-up interview in May, a month after he was separately charged with ethnic intimidation, institutional vandalism, and criminal mischief for allegedly scrawling a racial epithet on a desk in their room, authorities said. He admitted purchasing various chemicals with the intent of harming himself if he did poorly on exams and told police he mixed them in food and drinks stored in their shared refrigerator, prosecutors said. The Lehigh University Police Department has worked closely with the District Attorney Office on the investigation and will continue to do so. A spokeswoman for the school told NBC News, noting Yang is no longer enrolled as a student. From the outset, our concerns has been the health and safety of the victim of these alleged behaviors, and as such, Lehigh staff and faculty have been providing support service and assistance. All right. Now, it was again, we have uh, this uh, Yaki, Yaki Yang, Yaka Yang, Yaka Yang, right? 22, right? And we had another young brother there that was uh, 22 as well. His name was Jawan Royal. Here they had been roommates for some time. Thinking again, as I started before I played the video, oh, everything was good, right? They're smiling in your faces, right? Uh, you know, I'm playing the video games, talking about, you know, things in general or whatever. Maybe going to parties. Maybe, you know, maybe it's about girls. Maybe maybe, maybe his woman looking at, you know, Juwan. You know how they a little intimidated when we around? You know, always thinking that we could take their women, right? You know, that's what that melanin do. It creates that kind of infuse. So... Whatever the issue was with Yang, he decided that he gonna get back with Royal by putting, you know. But again, but before I say that, but did, did he make it sound again according to the way they wrote the article? They made it sound as if like, okay, he was buying this for himself, and he was gonna say, you know what? If I do, I guess he was doing some uh, samurai. Some samurai ass shit, right? That motherfucker was gonna kill himself if he didn't get a good a pass. Not, not an A. He said if he didn't pass. So damn, if you just got a D minus, right? You okay? So all you need was a D minus, right? So you bought that. Not you wouldn't think you could have got a D minus. Wait, man, you you Asian, man. Now again, the stereotype is y'all smarter than everybody except for Africans, right? But anyway, so anyway, um. So he says that he was taking it and putting his stuff in the refrigerator there because again, he has to concoct the mind to make you think that no, I, I was going to do it to myself and I had it already prepared. I had it in drinks and food, put it in the refrigerator that we both share, right? Well, we both share this, right? So it was uh, by accident he got to it. I really didn't do it. He did it on his own, but then you scrawled 
nigger on the damn desk. He said all kind of other shit, right? You you just you just was really showing showing your ass, right? You that's what you was doing. And so here was the young brother getting sick and not knowing why he's sick. He trembling and vomiting and you know what I'm saying? You know, you know what I'm saying? This going on. This dude is slowly, methodically poisoning you. Now he's a chemist. Right? Student, right? So he knows, again, it's kind of like the same thing when we talk about mm, this food we eat, right? We understand that a lot of food is mixed with all kinds of stuff in there. And when you read the ingredients, you, a lot of people don't even want to look at the ingredients. You don't know. You're just thinking that you're getting natural. We know that natural is not what natural is. Artificial flavors, well, we got flavor. The flavor we compound with these chemicals is going to get this. But then the prolonged use is going to create what? We know what they're going to create, right? We, you know, people are dying for all kinds. We got young people dying of cancer and all kinds of stuff, right? So, here's a chemistry student. is going to put his, he's so worried about, well, if he was flunking, when maybe the brother when he got sick, but obviously you must know pretty well that you was able to do exactly what you was using to get. Hopefully, maybe he wasn't a damn A student. Maybe, maybe you lucky, brother. You lucky he wasn't A student because he could have concocted some way but you would have just died. But maybe he got a kick out of watching you sick over there. Hmm? So you get to ask yourself, what is driving folks against black folks so much that y'all go all out your way? Matter of fact, Let's go back maybe a couple months ago. There was a white girl that did that to a sister in school where she was, you know, wiping herself and doing stuff and putting a, 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 a toothbrush in the toilet. You know what I'm saying? What? Really? I mean, come on, man. Now, I'm not saying all people don't have people in their, you know, their nation or ethnicity or race of people. They just don't do crazy stuff. But again, when you two different races trying to, you know, again, we, we, we have a common, you know, existence here. We go into school. We have to stand here in these rooms. And uh, you respect mine. I respect yours. And again, we try to have some camaraderie. If there's some disagreement, you find a way to move. But you don't do this and make this normal. And we're supposed to not say nothing, right? So that gets go to show that even though you may think that somebody is... You know, being thorough with you, being one hundred with you, but you never know. Again, the song that I sung earlier, "Smiling Faces," right? Sometimes they don't tell the truth, huh? Right? Like they say, a clown, clown on the outside smiling, but inside he most he devastated and tore up. And so here it was: this individual was actually going to slow poison you out of existence until you had took well, you couldn't take it no more, and then it come out. So again, this story is to be continued as time goes on. We shall see what happens. Because again, I can't understand that there ain't no temp murder in this. Hmm? It made this like something else that you could get bonded out so easily. Hmm? Hmm? Oh, oh, he is an international student too, right? Hmm. Yeah, right. Okay. So to be continued on that story, right? We'll, we'll be following up over here as, as, as it develops later down. All right, again, so we're talking about trusting folks, right? Trusting folks, right? So i seen this article here, or i seen this story here, right? And, uh, you know, as the continent, again, we have in the reemerging re of the what they call the carving of Africa, right? And everybody is acting as if like that's not what they doing, but we know that's what you really doing, right? And so again, by us being of the creator, I'ma say that with fact. We being of the creator, the only problem we got is with each other, and that's due to what transpired through us historically. But with anybody outside of us, we tend to be, you know what I'm saying, we're we got open door. Again, we'll give you a hammock. You don't got nowhere to lay down? We'll, we'll give you one of our squads. Come on over here, girl. I'm going to meet Mr. Christopher Columbus. Right? Right? He go ahead. Go ahead. He cool. He all right. Right? We even fix our dinner. We, huh? You want to eat? You want some turkey? Want some stuffing? Uh, yeah. Eat. Eat to you. You, you want to smoke some of this weed in this pipe? Come on. Come on. Let's get down. Right? And then wake up in the morning and got guns in your damn face. Right? That kind of shit. Right? 
All right, so now what's going on on the continent that oh, as long as you've been around, you should know the game by now, right? So uh, let me show you this, what I've seen. All right, let me show you this. And be right back, all right? Let me, let me see how this is going to do. Right. Let's see if we're gonna get it off. And one, two, three. Let's see if we're gonna do it. Come to the morning call. The no, morning call not. begins oh, right. Whoa, boy! It's, I mean, what is y'all? What y'all done did to this, man? I can't get. I can't get it to do what it normally do. It got to do it the way y'all gonna do it. Huh? All right. Well, we do it that way. That's fine. We do it that way. So, all right. So I'm gonna play this. Wait a minute. See if I got. Hold on. Hold on. Before I do that, let me see if I got. Um, okay. Okay, let's do this. I got a back to back on this, right? So let's do this back here. All right, so let's play these two, and I'll be back afterward, right? Well, welcome to the morning call. The morning call begins right now, and to our first leading story of the day, which takes us to Somalia. Now, the government has granted dozens of fishing licenses to China. The East African government signed 31 licenses with the China Overseas Fisheries Association in Mogadishu on Wednesday. According to the Somali's Fisheries Ministry, the move will um, ensure the resources are exploited legally. For years, there has been illegal fishing that dominated the Horn of African nation. This, combined by destructive fishing practices, insecurity caused by conflict, underdevelopment infrastructure, and competition from foreign fishing boats, have long threatened the sustainability of Somali fisheries. According to the Ministry of Fisheries, Somalia has 604 fish species, 420 of which are commercially viable. With an exclusive economic zone of 1.2 million kilometers square, the country can d derive up to $135 million per year from its marine resources. To ensure the companies comply with the terms of the contract, the government will deploy its own personnel on board. Political analyst Abdullahi Halake, who is speaking with us from Washington, D.C., in the United States. Hello and welcome to the program, Mr. Halake. Now, to our first question How will these 31 licenses granted to China affect the livelihoods of local fishermen, as already concerns have been raised that fishing stocks could be depleted? Of course, the licensing will affect the local Somali fishermen. Um, who are by their very nature not a large scale, you know, fishers. But if you are bringing the large trawlers, particularly the Chinese ones, they are not only going to outcompete the local Somali fishermen, but they will also be fishing without consideration for anything. In that regard, what I'm trying to point out is they will fish. Um, some of the fish species that probably they shouldn't and that will really lead to serious degradation and that could threaten the marine life inside Somalia. What are the main concerns about these licenses? There's been a lot of talk about the Chinese trying to take over all of Africa. This is another entry, don't you think? I think it's not just um, the Chinese, but also, you know, these fishing vessels uh, because of the nature, of, you know, for instance, lack of um, strong government inside Somalia, they've had a free reign. And as I have alluded to uh, in the first question, that can only have an adverse impact, not on the economic livelihood of the local Somali fishermen, uh, but also on the marine life um, and the ecosystem of uh, the Somali coast. And replenishing some of these um, fishes will, some of the fish will not be very easy. Uh, so therefore I think it wouldn't have come at the worst time for many inside Somalia. Never mind, Somalia and Kenya also have marine disputes that has not been settled. And so all these things will, will have to be considered uh, when thinking about it. Halakali, this is the first time that President Mohamed Abdullahi Farmaj's government has given fishing rights to foreigners since taking office last year. Also, we know that Farmaj just survived a no-confidence vote. Will he survive again if anything goes wrong with these licenses? I think uh, with respect to President, President Farmajo, the um, thing is, it's very difficult for the members of parliament to actually come out and start 
passing a vote of no confidence against him because some of these members of parliament um, I don't think they have enough credibility to start attacking the president. This is not to suggest that President Farmajo has done anything useful since coming in uh, when he had tremendous uh, groundswell of goodwill from so many people inside and outside Somalia, goodwill that has practically evaporated. But even more importantly, I think the Somali political elite need to be very careful over the years They've done nothing. The Somali government collapsed around the same time with the Ethiopian government. The Ethiopian government is now going through, um, you know, another round of transition, albeit not complete. But the Somali um, and Somalia are still stuck in the same vicious cycle of conflict. So they're really testing the patience of um, the, the local um, Somali man or woman on the street. So I don't think uh, he will be safe for now. Thank you very much, Halake, for your insights. That was Abdullahi Halake, an African security and political analyst based in Washington, D.C., in the United States of America. Halake was highlighting Somali's move, granting fishing licenses to China. The waters off the coast of Somalia famously became the most lawless in the world between 2010 and 2012, as pirates hijacked and ransomed commercial vessels at record rates. Since then, stepped-up international naval patrols and better security measures on ships appeared to have put the pirates out of business. But appearances can be deceiving. Once again, NewsHour Weekend Special Correspondent Jane Ferguson has our story. Every morning is busy at Basasso's port, with fishermen returning from the sea and delivering their catch right onto the beach. The waters off Puntland, a semi-autonomous region of Somalia, are rich with massive tuna. Immigrants, they are coming mostly. So they're from, from outside? India, from India, Ocean, and they are coming here. So they migrate through they Somali migrate waters? Through Somalia waters. So Somalia is very blessed with these fish? Yeah, too much. It's not just fish that pass through these waters. Commercial ships do too. And just a few years ago, this was the most dangerous place in the world for them. Pirates operated along the coast in Puntland, attacking 237 ships in 2011 alone, costing billions of dollars in ransoms, higher insurance premiums, and improving security in rerouting vessels. Since then, international naval patrols and better security measures on board ships made them harder to hijack. International efforts to arrest pirates were stepped up by various coast guards, and pirate prisons were built in Somalia and abroad and soon filled up. As business dwindled, many of the pirates yeah. here, who used to hijack ships, went back to their old jobs as fishermen. Down at the port, we met Zakaria Abuka and Abdikader Samatar, two former pirates. They're trying to earn an honest living this time around. Zakaria was a pirate for five years before spending a year in jail. He says he made over a hundred thousand dollars, but lost that money when he was arrested. Even if piracy weren't so risky these days, he complains, it takes a lot of capital to get it off the ground. It's really very difficult to go back to piracy. You have to buy food, oil, gas, diesel, guns, bullets, everything. You have to take a loan for this. All of this money will go on your account and if you don't pay it's very risky. But in fishing it's very easy. You go out for a day and come back. You will earn money and then you can buy your things. But making a decent living from fishing is tough. Whenever we go out fishing for around four to five days, when we come back, the money that we make is very little. 22-year-old Abdi Kader was just a teenager when piracy was at its height. Unlike Zakaria, he never got caught by the Coast Guard, and there's a part of him that misses the thrill of it. In piracy, you are a risk taker. Immediately when you see a boat or ship, you risk yourself. You don't care about anything. Your only aim is to catch it and you do whatever is possible to catch the boat. There are some ships that will vanish and we cannot catch them, but mostly we catch them because we use ladders, hand grenades, bazookas, so that when we fire they stop immediately. He's hardly a fisherman by choice. Given the chance, would you rather be a pirate or a fisherman? There is no chance to do piracy now. It's closed, but it is better than fishing. Somalia's ongoing civil war began in 1991 when the government collapsed.
Decades of chaos since then created an environment of lawlessness in a country full of guns and desperately poor people. A NATO effort to tackle piracy, Operation Ocean Shield, began in 2009 with warships patrolling the waters. They declared mission accomplished a year ago and stopped. Ben Llewellyn works with the Colorado-based think tank Oceans Beyond Piracy. A lot of the kind of on-the-sea mitigation efforts, which were um, uh, international naval coalitions, deployment of armed guards, and something called uh, adherence to best management practices or industry-recommended best management practices, which are things like uh, reporting in you know uh, vessels' location going into this uh, what's called the high-risk area, um, and, all, and kind of simpler things like. Uh, driving ships faster, um, you know, kind of hardening the, the vessel, all that really brought down a, um, you know, the incidence of Somali piracy. But it really just kind of mitigated the, the, the problem at sea. Despite all of those security measures, the conditions that created pirates in the first place still exist. People here need jobs. Somalis don't traditionally eat much fish. As an animal herding culture, many prefer to eat livestock like goats, cattle or sheep. So fishing as an industry here is rudimentary and often unprofitable. Efforts are underway to change that and take advantage of the country's vast, more than 1800 mile long coastline rich with fish. Access to domestic and international markets could change lives, but to sell fish internationally they will have to raise their standards. There might be plenty of fish here, but there's also plenty of filth. And if people want to make money out of these fish and export them, they're going to have to make this whole area much more clean and much more professional. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization is trying to do that. They are building a new fish processing plant next door. It's not being used yet, but hopes to provide hygienic places to chop up fish and chill rooms to store it. Other changes will be needed in how the fish are caught and brought in from the water too. John Purvis is the project's manager. What is needed here is a transformation of, of the sector and that, that's going to involve change at the point where the fish is caught. It's going to involve change where the fish is moved from the fishing ground to the land, particularly the landing site, and then the, the whole marketing processing export area. And there needs to be change at every point in that uh, value chain, if you like. Animal herders from inland are suffering from a devastating drought. As their camels and goats die, they are fleeing, destitute, to refugee camps like this one, just outside the coastal town of Basasso. The UN is teaching the women from the camps to process and dry fish so they can feed their families as well as sell it to make money. Boys from the camp are also being taught to fish. These young men grew up around livestock and know little about boats. So the experienced fishermen down at the port are passing on their knowledge. Eager to show us around their training vessel, they gave us a tour. The hope is that one day they will make good wages from an export industry here. Are we likely to see Somali fish exported to Europe, to the States? Yeah, yeah, why not? You look at the, the target here, is the, a lot of the target is for the migrating tuna that is caught by vessels in Kenya, Tanzania, Seychelles, Mauritius. And that fish goes, it's handled well, and it goes globally. It, it can find it in any market across the globe. And there's no reason that that same stock tuna fish coming into Somali waters shouldn't enter the, the same market. That will take many years, however. Years during which these communities will keep struggling to develop, leaving the lure of piracy to remain. Last spring, pirates in Puntland snatched their first commercial vessel in years. It was a reminder that piracy might return if conditions on land don't improve and security at sea continues to relax. And it's not just small-time piracy the world has to fear. There are more powerful figures waiting in the shadows, says John Purvis. The part that is not here active at the moment is the, the organized uh, syndicate part of it. That probably has businesses elsewhere on the continent and in the, uh, in the world. But if they decide to see an opportunity to come back again and reorganize their networks, their chains, that's still there. The kingpins, the so-called kingpins, are still, still active. And that's a warning for sailors worldwide, that the waters off Somalia could once again become a pirate's paradise.
The waters off the coast of Somalia famous. All right, y'all. Uh, so I'm back. Yeah, I got to do so much over here because the behind the scene things, boy. If I told you, wouldn't believe it. But anyway, so let me show you what came up about two days ago, December the twenty fourth, in the courts. It says China will start fishing alongside Somalia's coastline, just as piracy makes a comeback. You know I'm going to say that again. China will start fishing along Somalia's coastline just as piracy makes a comeback. Again, this is done in the courts. And this is how it reads. The country with mainland Africa's longest coastline is inviting China to its shores. Somalia granted fishing license to 31 Chinese vessels to exploit tuna and tuna-like species off its coast in a bid to tap the sector for economic growth. The vessels are associated with the Chinese Overseas Fisheries Association, a distant water trawling group created in 2012 to promote the East Asian giant competitive fishing edge abroad. Starting this month, ships will be allowed to operate for a one-year period in Somali's water with the agreement stipulating an automatic renewal for an additional year. Foreign fishing vessels will also not be permitted to operate between 24 nautical miles, which is 44 kilometers, to seaward side of Somalia baseline and the Somali baseline in order to protect small-scale fishing operations. Upon entering or leaving Somalia's exclusive economic zone, the boats will also have to declare their positions besides the weight of catch on boards by species. The Horn of Africa nation, especially known for its seasonally high abundance of large pelagic fish and diverse tuna samples, including the yellowfin, longtail, and big eye tuna. Yet the sectors have remained untapped, bedeviled by poor infrastructure, lack of regulation, and a culture that prizes meat from livestock over seafood. By authorizing foreign permits, Somali authorities hope to make the sector sustainable generate revenue, and also contribute to national and international trade. Somalia has never had a long domestic industrial fishing fleet and has mostly used foreign fleets to undertake fishing from them. After the current deal was announced, an accurate news circulated on Twitter that China would rebuild the seaport in Magadishu through a loan in exchange for exp exclusive fishing rights and partial control of the harbor until the arrear were paid. The deal arose including among Somali lawmakers fear that China was entrapping Somalia in debt. Accusations rebutted, but some Somali officials. In West Africa, however, Chinese vessels have been accused of depleting stock and using OPEC measures to obtain licenses and threatening the livelihood of fishermen. Beijing, increasingly aware of these practices, have cracked down by removing subsidies and revoking the license of fishing firms conducting illegal activities. In Somalia, the worry about the new pack is heightened by what this will mean for artisanal fishing communities. One of the key underlying reasons for piracy off the Somali shore was the depletion of seafood resources through illegal fishing by foreign companies. But as armed patrol reduced and ship gradually came back, research has shown that piracy incidents doubled in 2017 compared to 2016. This will likely be one challenge the Chinese vessels might have to deal with, even though the agreement with Somali government allows them to have armed guards on board. All right, so... You know, I, sometimes I see stuff international, and again... Family, right? Continent is family to us, right? Even though sometimes we can find bills and some people say that we are not them. Eh, you know, we, it is what it is, right? So we see that, again, our generosity. Now we heard in the article where it says that, well, you know, Somalia don't even really eat fish. 
They're more of a meat. They kind of you know, They eat the meat. They don't eat goats and you know beef and they don't really know about the fish. But they do fishing as part of just uh, to make some money, right? So it would be incumbent on them to again. You know, if they want to get this market that they got that other people are eyeing, that's the key word, right? Other people are eyeing, because you remember you heard the dude in the video, say, oh, yeah, the tuna could let's get into the European market. You know, yeah, someone's eyeing it, right? And they say, well, you're kind of in the way. So what did you start seeing? You start seeing some of their food dying, drying up, and now they have to eat fish. And they, that ain't what we eat. We don't eat fish. Or oh, oh, the UN came and said, "Oh, well, you're gonna teach you how to dry the fish so you can feed your fish." You know, okay? And, and what the rest of you gonna do is you're gonna go out there and you fish, and then what you can do, you can make some money doing it, right? Think about that. Africa, the most richest continent on the planet, but cannot harvest, redistribute its own product, right? That somebody third party has to come in, get you out the way, and then they gonna make all the money. Hmm? It just seems like all around the world it's the same song, right? Same song, right? And so the kindness of the heart is, well, we're gonna give them 30 to government, we're gonna give them just a license, we're gonna allow them to do fish for a year, we're gonna give them a renewal, you know, uh, right? But in the same aspect, again, they're greasing the palms. Why right? we're gonna give you this money? I don't take the, don't, no, no questions asked, huh? Oh, you pay it back when you can get it, huh? Ain't that's the way it's been going pretty much all? I done did quite a few stories, right? 160 billion this time, came back 40 billion this time. So now we're gonna, all we're gonna do is we're gonna help you with the infrastructure. We're gonna build this and this, this and that, and, and here's some money. Why is why you can build up stuff, but you ain't gonna be able to pay it back. Hmm? That's just what it is. You're just not going to be able to pay it back. So it's a con game. Con game is being played, right? And so, again, we're just seeing that it's, you know, conning the whole continent. And after a while, again, as I said before, we will be some of the last people, especially being over here as DOS, to know, again, like we got a lot of our people who study, you know, uh, African studies, committing studies, and know a lot about Kemet and Egypt and Africa, and we're gonna be the last to know that that continent was black. They gonna undercut it, and then we're gonna just slowly see people dissipating and more migration coming in. As, they, as you're gonna see later on in the in the show, some other things that's going on again, just rewriting it. And again, when you're in a situation that they're in, just like we in a situation we in over here, right? How you, again, got talent, but you can't really package it and resell it. Now, let's see what Mr. Blows Your Mind is over here trying to make him a news channel, right? I got history too, right? But, but again, you don't want this. You, know, you want me to do it the way you want me to do it. So I can have talent and do something, but if you can't make the money or not the way you want it done, then it can't be made. So that's the same thing over there, right? Say, so, well, you know, the facility is a little too dirty. You know, you have to do it better. Have to be fresher. Hmm. Uh, you know, as you, we 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 know behind closed, but kind of kind of say it's a whole country. You know, the s whole countries, right? So we're gonna just again. We're going to let these people seem like they're the ones doing it. We're not going to do it. They're going to do it. As if, again, behind closed doors, they all ain't together. Right? So, again, I just brought that to you. Again, anytime you got something, you can't hold on to it. It's because, again, it's kind of like saying, let's say Haiti. Haiti got embargoed. Right? They got all that natural resource that they now coming back and they claiming and taking oil and they got all kinds of natural resources, but they could never package it themselves and present it to the world so that they can have a GDP in and all that. Right? No, no, no. Well, you're the worst and the poorest country in the world. and We're going to keep you like that. But when we come over there, guess what we discovered? Oil. We discovered this. We discovered that. Like they didn't know that it was, it was always there. It's just the game, right? It's just the game. It's just what it is, right? 
All right, so moving on. Let me, let me look out of here and see what I got up in the house. I got a couple people that left, huh? I couldn't take it. I know who they was, but okay. So I got I got uh, Alfred Yah Israel. What's good, brother? Uh, oh, is that Afria? Afri? Uh, oh, is that Alfred Yah? Is either Alfreya or Alfreda? Okay, I hope you're a brother. Okay, uh, yeah, Kabir was good. Uh, who else I got up in here? Yo, Safina Z. Carado. Is that perpetual hate in them? The envy for the lack of melanin driving them crazier? They are hating. I was looking at that sub and uh, sub and sub and cut. Oh, the sub. Okay, they cut his hair and all those looking. Yeah. Um. You know, man, um, like I was saying the same thing, too. There were so many people that was there who were just spectators. You mean to tell me not well, nobody of us in there that would have been like, hold on, man. You know what I'm saying? I mean, sometimes we're going to have to pull coattails and be like, hey, man, wait, that shit ain't cool, man. I mean, ain't show me in the rules and regulation what that says this is. Because it's coaching them wasn't shit. Right? None of them, and they didn't get no fuck. And the girl that had the scissor was like, she enjoyed that shit, right? Right, and uh, again, they was filming it. And I'm pretty sure they probably gonna have that in the yearbook and all that. You know what I'm saying? So it's like there should have been some parental intervention somewhere, right? And again, we always talk about all these good white folks. Nobody didn't say nothing. It was all more like, oh, let's see how this gonna go, right? That kind of shit. So you know, it is what it is, man. But again, you know, we start talking about that. Oh, you're running. Oh, the white person gonna run out of here every time, ain't you? Gonna run, huh? You know, like, see, again, Dracula don't like looking at himself in the mirror. He want to make it always seem like the reflection is just you. It ain't like he ain't doing nothing. It's just you. Anyway, hit that like. Hit that like button, dislike button, subscribe, comment, whatever it is. Moving on, we're going to move to the next part. I see other stuff in here. Uh, so what else I got up in here? All right, so um, my show a little raggedy because they got me doing stuff. But, okay, so, again, you know that the... Um, you know that they said in the shutdown Washington, right? You know, y'all, you know that's all about, right? right it, you know, Muggs is like, man, hurry, we want this. We, we, you know, this, this is about defending the country. This is about keeping Muggs out, right? So let's look at what the President Trump has said, and then behind that, there was somebody who said something behind that. So check this out and be right back. If I can get the play. Get the, can I get the play? Hold on, try it again. It's amid a backdrop of yet another partial government shutdown, triggered by an impasse on Capitol Hill that could now stretch into the new year. President Trump tweeting today that he's, quote, all alone in the White House, waiting for Democrats to come back with a budget deal. ABC's White House correspondent Tara Palmieri has more. Tonight, President Trump and Melania together at the White House asking children what they want for Christmas. What's Santa going to get you for Christmas? But the president's still stewing about the shutdown. We need border security. Earlier tweeting, I'm all alone, poor me, in the White House waiting for the Democrats to come back and make a deal on desperately needed border security. The battle over the president's border wall will likely drag the shutdown past New Year's. This is what Washington looks like when you have a president who refuses to sort of go along to get along. President Trump adding to the confusion with another tweet about where the money will come from. The complete wall will be built with shutdown money plus funds already in hand. But congressional approval is required to reallocate any funds. Today, Democratic leaders Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer saying that Trump is, quote, plunging the country into chaos. President Trump has been on a destructive two-week temper tantrum, demanding the American taxpayer pony up for an expensive and ineffective border wall. The White House has backed off its demand for $5 billion in border funding, but Schumer and the Democrats won't budge above $1.3 billion. This is about politics. It's about hating Trump, and it's not about America. Tonight, President Trump also fighting a battle against one of his exiled generals, Secretary of Defense Jim Mattis, after moving his exit date up to January 1st. He's now directly attacking Mattis for favoring subsidies for foreign militaries. 
tweeting, General Mattis did not see this as a problem. I do, and it's being fixed. Mattis resigned in response to the president's call to pull all troops from Syria in the fight against ISIS. Now we've won. It's time to come back. Mattis writing a scathing resignation letter saying, quote, we cannot protect our interests without maintaining strong alliances. The president praised Mattis at first, but sources tell ABC News he grew more angry after sharp criticisms from his own party, criticisms that persist. I'm devastated by this, and I think that what Mattis did was very important for our country. When House Democrats gain control of the Congress on January 3rd, they will vote on a bill to reopen the government that doesn't include funding for the border wall. And then they'll pressure Senate Republicans to do the same, but the president can still veto that bill to keep the government shut down. Tom? Tara Palmieri for us tonight. Tara, thank you. This has been really interesting debate because our friends on the other side, Mr. Speaker, it's like they have amnesia and nothing happened before the election a couple years ago. All of these promises about a, a border wall were followed by the cheers and the chants of, and who's going to pay for that wall? And you remember all your fans would stand up and they, Mexico's going to pay for that wall. Who? Mexico. And here we are today getting ready to shut down the government over you asking the American taxpayer to pay for this border wall. And then some of you even used to say, are saying that, that we have hollow words, that our words don't mean anything. When this president is going back on the promise that he made, he said Mexico was going to pay for it. He said it at the rallies. He was in Ohio. He was in the swing states. And now he's going back on his word on that. And he just went back on his word where he promised the entire Senate he was going to support the continuing resolution. And you're calling us and saying our words are hollow? Are you kidding me? Now, look, I'm for border security. I'm for border security, but I'm not for a wall. You know what? I like cars, too. I'm for cars. I'm not for the Model T. I like planes. I don't want a glider that was designed and built by Wilbur Wright. I like my phone, but I don't want to go back and get the rotary dial out. You guys are living in the past. And this government is in chaos. It's in a free fall. The market's in a free fall. The staffing at the White House is in a free fall. The Secretary of Defense is gone. We're pulling out of Syria. What is going on? You are in charge of the House, Senate, and White House. Get a grip and learn how to govern the country. This is Congressman Tim Ryan with the only thing that Republicans should be listening to on the verge of yet another Trump shutdown. With Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer setting a good precedent with last week's meeting with Trump on how not to roll over, it seems that Democrats are finally waking up in Washington. Republicans have had control of all three branches of government. Yes, including the Supreme Court, including both houses of Congress. And what do they have to show for it? The deficit will hit $1 trillion this year. Wages are basically stagnant. The stock market is in negative territory for 2018. Economists are warning of another recession. They've waged war on Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, on access to voting, on health care for 20 million people, on immigrant kids, on the air and water, on the FBI, and the rule of law. Besides a $5 billion wall to satisfy Trump's ego, what do Republicans actually stand for? Based on what the last two years have shown us, it's not much, and the entire country knows it. It's fitting that the last move of the Republican-controlled government will be to send hundreds of thousands of federal employees off to celebrate Christmas without pay. Just the icing on the cake for the most anti-American administration in modern U.S. history. got a little glimpse of those who probably didn't know nothing about why the, you know they shut down Washington right so it has a lot to do with the fact that they want to put their wall up now you remember going back in the campaign right that was all uh, you know they was all cheering yeah and Mexico's gonna pay for it and you know the people that was you know such Trump supporters they was all cheering and clapping and that I mean I guess that sounded good right I'm trying to figure out how you make somebody pay for something that you putting up 
Now, I, I, my understanding about property on a fence is like two sides to the fence, right? Right? It, it borders, like, you got the property who next to you and then your side, right? So it's kind of like if you got a tree, your tree is on the other side, you know, you can cut because it's over on your property, right? So you might pay for your side of the wall, but the other side, I mean, how you expect them to pay for on your side too, right? When you the one who wanted the wall. So again, that was kind of like, you know, tickling the fancy of those people who want to hear that. Again, for defense of your country, yes, you need to have protection, right? You want to keep you want to keep the riff rams out. I get that. Again, you don't always go to sleep at night with your door unlocked and your windows all open, right? Especially if you live where I live, you don't do that shit like that, right? <laughs> so I'm just saying, right? So in that aspect, you understand it. But again, you again you can't make the people flip the bill for it. I mean, there's enough on the plate as it is. And again, as they talk about a lot of the declining action for the, the, you know, the stock market is dropping, right? Those who went to that Bitcoin, you should be understanding that too, right? And so, you know, it's kind of funny that, okay, you know, I'm going to shut it all down until y'all come up with we, how we going to squeeze some more out of the juice, out of the pit. Matter of fact, y'all ain't got no money. Matter of fact, y'all think y'all need to be talking to DOS, you need to be talking to the, dentist, the descendants of slaves about some money. All this wall shit. When we gonna cut our check? When we gonna get our check? You know what I'm saying? Where's our check at? You got, huh? Oh, Pac, what that first Pac said? You got money for wars, but can't feed the poor. Right? So you got money for wars, but you can't get back. And then again, you want to, you're trying to heal. You want to make it great again. And the only way I can see great again is what you had once upon a time. And I don't know if you're going to be able to put that genie back in the bottle like that, right? Not, not that easy, right? And so, you know, you got, you got, you're got you writing checks. You're writing bounce checks. Because a lot of that money that y'all got, that's our money. You know what I'm saying? You you allocate our money. Y'all ain't got no money. This country ain't got no money. All the money belong to us. Right? You you owe, you need to start, you know what I'm saying? You know how they be saying like the people that be in entertainment and stuff, they get residual checks. I think if you a DOS, we should be getting some kind of residual checks, right? Right? You should be getting some checks. Every month there should be a check coming in with your name, a descendancy check, right? Shit. You got money for all this other shit. Where our shit at? I ain't going to get into all the politics shit because that shit ain't got nothing to do with us no way. We in this motherfucker, right? Now, we, we, we can either choose to leave or whatever. If you ain't on the list, like Mr. Blow, right probably on the list. So, you know, I can't get up out of here. But, you know what I'm saying? But we in here. So, we don't have a problem with you encasing the keeping the riffraff out. Because we think we got too many riffraff as it is, right? We got too much riffraff around here. That's why we in the, the state we've been in. Because you never wanted to deal with us in the first place. Say so it says dealing with us. Because again we've been around you longer. So we understood the game. So you can't run the game. You know okay I'll give you a good analogy. Right let's say you got a little brother little sister. Right you the oldest. Whether you girl or, or, or man or woman. Right you a little brother right. You remember back in the day. Uh, somebody gave y'all somebody. Like around this time right you know. Again, maybe now you don't celebrate that, but then back when you was little when, you know, your parents and then they might have did it depending on who, what kind of people you come from. So somebody gave you money. So let's say uh, uncle gave you a 20 spot, right? I gave you a 20, right? Gave y'all all, let's put it this way. Say it's four, it's three of y'all, right? Say it's three, you and two other siblings. So uncle gave 20s, right? All right. So he gave... The littlest one, the $20 solid. Gave the next one two tens, right? And gave the oldest one four fives. Now, you know how the oldest one is. You always got, the, again, you the slick one, but I'm going to say it's the middle one. You know, the oldest one know better. So let's say the middle child. Middle child looking at the baby one. Well, you got one. I got two tens, right? Matter of fact, let's do it this way. Okay, he instead of him saying he got the oldest one got okay, so the oldest one got two ten and the middle one got the four fives, right? So the middle one tells the youngest one, like, hey, I'll give you two of these these two fives for that one twenty. Now you know the baby one don't know no different, right? He don't know the difference that the twenty ain't ain't equivalent to he just know it's two dollars. You know what I'm saying? He said two bills. 
So he like, okay, you give him the two fives and give him the 20, right? Now you done came up, right? You done conned him, right? <laughs> That's how these motherfuckers is, right? But you ain't giving a shit. You con the shit out of us all the time, a lot of bullshit, but you ain't handing us shit, right? You just giving us, again, bounce check, paper, promises, right? Whole lot of bullshit, but we ain't getting them. We like the little one and shit. You know, you know kind of that. The next thing you know, you know, he, you know, fell asleep. You know, when you pocket and took the other one. Now, the one crying to me, I can't find my money. Everybody, well, okay, everybody know somebody done stole the shit, right? And that's how it is. You know, they keep stealing your money. Got us crying and shit. Then, where's our money yet? You got money for everything else? We gonna give us out some money. You know, give us some residual check. Again, fuck it. We're going to do the DNA test. Take the DNA test. If your ass can prove that you part of the DOS, then give some residual checks every month. Right? Like a social security check or whatever it is. Right? And shit, you do what you got to do with that money. Right? Uh, if the rest of your country, y'all going under, y'all going underwater, that's your problem. We done already been, we done did our work yet. It's time for us to, again, as King said, come to collect a check. Right? But anyway, so that's what that whole government shit is. They all about that whole bullshit about that wall. But I'm saying you got some other shit. You got some other bills to pay, right? That was the promise you told them that was supporting you, that you were going to make them do it. I don't know how you're going to make them do it. And they ain't had no money to do it in the first place. They, they country been depleted too. You understand? Go all the way back to the oil with the Rockefellers and all that. That all they've been gone, right? So what money they got if they all fleeing to come over here to get a better life? Even just picking oranges and all that shit is better than that. Because the money, they ain't got no money. So how are they going to pay for the wall? Come on, man. And people fail for that shit. Anyway, let me move on. Let me move, let me move the fuck on. All right, so, because I don't want to get too long in it. Because I'm, I'm definitely trying to get this second show in tonight. So y'all, I'm going to do that second. I ain't going to, I'm, I'm going to get that second one in. So I'm always at an hour 45 mark. So let me go ahead and, um. Let me see what else I got in here. All right, so check this out, right? As I'm talking about what I'm talking about. So, again, I seen this. I'm like, man, you know, boy, they always on something, ain't they? They always, right? So check this out. This is coming. It's just a matter of time. Just a matter of time. So, all right, so let me play this. And we come right back. All right, come on. Damn, boy, don't, they just really doing all kind of stuff, man. What's going on, man? Y'all really, y'all really be doing doing me dirty, huh? It's all right. We're going to make it work, though. Behind the scenes. All right, so check this out. The future is a wave of a hand away. In case you missed it, here it is again. This is a whole new level of security. No keys or access cards, difficult to steal and copy, but the technology requires a certain level of commitment that's not for the faint-hearted. So this is where the microchip implant story begins, for those who want them at least. A clinical setting, a sterile environment, with some rather daunting bits of medical kit. So talk us through what happens next. So first part of the procedure is Local anaesthetic is applied, so just your hand there. Then we'll use a scalpel just to make a small incision, just there. And then finally, it's the rather large needle applicator, and that will be pushed just... I'll stop you there for me, in my case at least. I think everyone really wants to know is, does it really hurt? Completely pain-free. The UK firm Biotech offers implants to businesses and individuals. It's fitted 150 implants in the UK so far and the numbers rising. Assistive technology for disabled people, we implant um, banking, security, uh, general users, so contactless payments, passport data, all could be stored on these microchips and embedded in your hand. Comes down to convenience, I suppose, for a lot of people. It's very hard to lose your hand. Uh, it's easy to lose your keys, your wallet, so a lot of certain demographics want that convenience. This is one of several implant firms reportedly in discussions with British financial and legal companies. The names of the companies are being closely guarded. This isn't new technology. Microchips have been implanted in pets for many years, but the prospect of implanting them in employees has sparked concerns from trade unions. 
And microchipping gives even more uh, control and power uh, to the employer, um, and that uh, comes with inherent risks and dangers. Uh, those risks and dangers uh, shouldn't just be ignored by an employer. Uh, they need to take those into consideration, and they definitely shouldn't be uh, pressuring any workers uh, into uh, being microchipped. Biotech companies say the technology should be voluntary and that people must have a right to privacy. But with one Swedish firm, Biohacks, claiming to have already implanted 4,000 people, there were worries microchipping could eventually become the new normal. Societies embrace the mobile phone, making us easy to track on a daily basis. But by implanting microchips, there may be few places left to truly escape from technology. Neve Barker, Al Jazeera. London. All right. So, uh, right, 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 right. Huh? So I guess what I was just talking about earlier, if we're going to get some checks, right? If we're going to give a universal check, you're going to have to take that implant, right? Think about that. So you have employee, you employee, let's say you're an employee right now, right? So you don't own your own business, right? You hit the clock. You got the nine to five, eight to four, seven to three, whatever it might be, overnight shift, whatever it might be. And then again, you know, maybe you got that already. You know, you have some places where they change from punching the old manual clock, right? To they used to have a card swipe clock to now they got thumbprint, right? Clocking in, right? Hmm. So you know what they do? They bring it in increments, right? Slowly implementing it, right? You you yeah, you say you're already used to being tracked. You got a cell phone. You already got a low jack. You know, back in the day you see somebody with that the square on their leg, but oh they got a house arrest. Well, most people walking around already got that on them. You know what I'm saying? You know they got those uh sites and stuff that you can you know put in the phone and you can see. Again, they talking about I think I played that last last week or so, right? Hey, you went here, you know, you, it's, it's tracking all your movement, right? So the requirement going to be for it to be employed is take this chip, right? If you want, you getting some kind of government assistant, take this chip, right? Right? Uh, you want to, you know, they, they made it sound, oh, you know, the dog get lost, Blue Angel, right? Remember that Blue Angel? Stick that in there, oh, so you can find your dog. Then they say, now put it in the kids. As a matter of fact, they've probably been putting in this already unbeknownst because you know you know there's a period of time when you have your baby and you keep the baby with you and they tell me well, we're gonna go wash the baby all right we come back the baby be not cold out and you be like damn what the hell they do to the baby yeah i just get you know a bath with a, you know, a nice warm bath right, probably, we don't know what the hell they done did to the baby back there right Maybe I got a chip in them, huh? Depending on what generation you come out, you probably got an old model chip, you know what I'm saying? And certain from different generations, got new model, up-to-date ones, right? So they're going to make it mandatory. So we're going to get some of that old stuff out the way and get some of them updated and let them know. But they're going to do it in a way that you have no choice but to take it. Again, some people say biblical, huh? Mark of the beast in the hand, right? You remember some people talking about that, right? I remember that old commercial they used to came on about the massacre, right? Y'all, some of y'all might remember. It was, it was, it was people that was in like a like a lunch line, and then people were just going and swiping. And the one dude came with cash and it stopped everything, and they was all looking and frowning, <laughs> you know. Well, that's how it's gonna be, right? So if you don't have to be able to swipe your hand, to register, that goes to your bank routing number, to go to the extract, so it ain't gotta do you. It's it's again, <laughs> you know, fast pace. One thing right now, instantaneous, right? And you know, a lot of people like to talk about the the, the greatness of technology. Now, again, technology has its goods as well as it got its bad. So, with this kind of technology, what else can it do besides just waving your hand to open your door, wave your hand to pay a bill? Could it also have some transmitting? rays or you know that has something to do with you know again because i remember they were talking about having some kind of a detection in airports that can read to see if you again if your temperament yeah, okay you seem a little angry you hear as a terrorist or you know some shit like that right so again you know it looked like a little grain of rice but you know some people think bigger the, the bigger the package the more powerful it is 
small stuff can have a powerful pack too and can do a lot more and it's technology it's all up in there right again they didn't want to disclose even i couldn't even find an article they could need disclose on that right so again things is changing because again you know people trying to put the genie back in the bottle which is us right again you know this little corner has been powerful that's why you know facebook was doing what it's doing youtube doing what it's doing and everything they again because people trying to do you know this the bread and butter this is how motherfuckers they do they they opulent life as long as you ain't got nothing to you know go to and keep your money and be on no they keep giving it to them they can live opulence and you stay in the condition right so you trying to get out of that that's detriment to somebody else they ain't trying to do that Okay, that's to be continued, y'all. Just pay attention. As as more develop, I will show. All right, so what else I got in here? Cause I'm always I'm at the two hour mark. I want to get I'm um, getting at the two hour mark, so I want to be out here by two and a half, so I can get on for this next show for the night. So I came across this. Hmm. This one here, right? This one right here. Now listen and pay attention. It's kind of quick. It's real quick, right? Matter of fact, it's real quick. I ain't even gonna do the article on because I can't quit on that because I have. All right, so check this out real quick. So let's see what happened. See if I can get the play. There it go. Oh, it's going back to it. Huh? The caves of northern Spain reveal art dating back thousands of years. One particular faded dot is said to be over 40,000 years old. Al Jazeera reports. Which is a good 15 millennia, 15,000 years older than originally thought. A new date suggests the art could have been made by Neanderthals rather than by modern man. Scientists examined the crust that had formed on top of the paintings of the cave. The BBC says these atoms decay at a very precise rate through the ages, and the ratio of two different elements in any sample can therefore be used as a kind of clock to time the moment when the calcite crust first formed. But the question remains, who made it? The cave art dates back to a time when modern humans just migrated out of Africa. New scientists indicate Neanderthals may have mimicked the drawings produced by modern humans without understanding what they meant. The use of symbolism is a trait that set our animal species apart from all others. Scientists believe this discovery will tell us more about the evolution of the human race. For Newsy, I'm Logan Tittle. Multiple sources, the real story. All right. There's an article. Let me see if I can pull that up. I had an article for that. Right? Uh, there's an article that talked about Let's see if I can pull it. I know I got it right here. Oh, give me one second, y'all. Um, article was talking about they found. Maybe it's over here. Let me check over here. Let me see over here. Hold on one second. Let me see. What did I do with that? Let's see. So the article said they had, again, about the oldest painting found in the cave. They said it's done by, you heard it, the Neanderthals. And I was like, really? Really? Right? So let me see if I got the article. I got it here. And, you know, they're saying they be having me off my square a little bit. Let's see. Where it go? Where did it go? I got the video, but where is the article I had? Huh? Where's the article? Yeah, I tell you, but the stuff they be doing behind the scenes, boy, y'all wouldn't believe it if I told you. Okay, so that's not it. So let me check here right quick. Let me give me one quick second, y'all. One quick second. Yeah, that shit doesn't that make no damn sense at all, right? I, I had all this been, been. All right, so anyway, let's see. Yeah. I got so much on, on here. That's so much stuff I be reading, man. Y'all, you wouldn't, you ain't, y'all, you don't know. All right, so, I'm sorry. Okay, I got, damn, I got that much on here? Man, I got to erase some of this shit. I got, damn, I'm still spinning this. All right, come on. Really? All right, so, anyway. I'm going to just show the pictures I got to it. All right, so, they saying that,
Had to knock my mic out. How much did they knock my mic out, y'all? Huh? Huh? How much did they have to knock the mic out? Huh? Yeah, they j oh, you were hearing them, you hearing them jiggling in the wires. Cause ain't no jiggling in the wires on my end. I'm talking, so ain't no reason why my wires be jiggling. That's bull that's that's unforeseen occurrences happening, right? That's the, that's behind the scenes. But again, of course they're gonna do that because ain't nobody gonna ain't nobody gonna show this to say that, right? And so you upset because why? I'm showing what everybody supposed to already know, but you gonna keep making like trying to make us seem like we ain't shit. Shit, we gave the world to make matter of fact that you in it. So it's a lot of bullshit. But anyway, so I'm gonna finish up. So again, that was something they put out there again, talking about the oldest cave paintings, trying to put it to the Neanderthal, but it can't be the Neanderthal for the simple fact that you said it mimic. It mimicked how to do art. It mimicked what it did. And all we see that you said that the caveman did was a handprint. But who drew is not you. But again, you got to keep, again, got to keep taking away, keep taking away. Right? I'm not talking about video out, low output. They doing everything to try to check me off, boy. I'm telling you, you, better give me some likes, man. Give me some likes. Give me some subs. Give me something, man. Let me tell you something. What I go through to try to put a show on in here, don't no show go through what I go through. No show go through what I go through, right? And that's not me being facetious like I'm better or something. No, no. I'm just saying. You should be able to recognize if you've been over here long enough. So, all right. So, let me go on and get out before they trying to knock me all the way out. Okay. So, um, now, 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 just to top that shit right there, right? We're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and top that one. Because this article just came out. Uh, matter of fact, the article came out. I got the article. And then you see the video. So, check this out. Be right back. It is under this baobab tree that the story begins, three million years ago in Africa, with the beginning of the human species. It's a tale of a long journey from which most never returned, part of the slave trade. There was sorrow and destruction along the way, but also color, courage, the spiritual, and humor, leaving those that want to learn more in awe. It's so overwhelming, I don't really understand it. Some of it's familiar, some of it's not, but it definitely grabs you by the gut. The Museum of Black Civilization has been 52 years in the making. It's the brainchild of Senghor, Senegal's first president, nicknamed the Poet President because he spent a third of the national budget on arts and culture. It's a legacy President Macky Sall is carrying on. La conservation De la culture a sauvé les peuples africains. Keeping our cultures is what saved African people from attempts made at making them soulless people without a history. And if culture does link people together, it also stimulates progress. Work on the museum only began in 2015 after a $34 million donation from China. The exterior was inspired by the medieval city of Great Zimbabwe, now a World Heritage Site while the inside is modeled on a Senegalese hut, 14,000 square meters in size. With this museum, the call from African countries to get their artifacts back can no longer be ignored because this space is a celebration of global black artistic expression. And so whether stolen or not, much of it comes from outside the continent. Amadou Boukoum, the museum's director, shows us the 18th century sword of Al-Hajj Omar. It was stolen from Senegal and is in possession of the French, who have now lent it to the museum. When they stole our belongings, they weren't art, they were just objects of daily life. But then colonizers defined these objects as African art. The aim of this museum is to show that African art is in fact much bigger than that. Our focus is not just on the past, but also on the future and the voice of the diaspora. A large part of the museum is dedicated to contemporary art, with many pieces from the Caribbean. The diversity of the collection that's been assembled so far is unique. For many Africans who come to visit, it is much more than a museum. 
It's a mirror to see themselves in a new light. Nicholas Hawk, Al Jazeera, Dakar. All right. So we see that uh, that there's a museum, a new museum has been opened in Senegal, tracing millions of years of African history. The Museum of Black Civilization is provoking calls for the return of African artifacts taken away from former colonial slave traders. Right? So isn't it kind of funny when you heard in the in in the in the clip there it talked about that the French is going to loan, <laughs> going to loan you, just crazy, right? It's kind of like saying when again, I ain't got no horse in no race about OJ, right? That was his business, what he did, okay. And again, I know everybody trying to make it, a, you know, that black people. So, no, we, I don't think we, it was just about what was whatever it was, right? So here, remember, OJ got 33 years for trying to get back his own shit. Remember that shit? He got 33 years in jail for trying to get his own shit back that another motherfucker had stole that he was trying to go back and collect. Yeah, made the way he did it, trying to, and boys, it, it was all a setup, right? It was all a fucking setup, right? But the, 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 the point there is this. It was his shit. But he had to do it then to stick up to get his own shit back. The mother didn't want to give his shit back. So it's the same thing here. You know what you done stole. You know what you done took. And yet, you don't want to give it back without any kind of stipulations and attachment. It ain't yours. You know why that is? Because... Again, if you go back, if everybody collect again, it was a, I remember I forgot what book it was I had read, and it said if every nation came to a world picnic, right? Everybody from every nation came, right? So just think of all the different nation nationalities of people in their culture they bring to the picnic, but they said somebody would only could bring nothing but an appetite. <laughs> Do I need to say that again? It said if it was a world picnic that everybody had to bring something from their culture. Everybody would bring something from their culture, background, religion, all that stuff. But one person, particular people, would only bring an appetite. That's what I'm saying. You got everybody's stuff. Look what happened in China when they, after the wars and them gutting out China. It's like got all this art, this art that you got. That they got out of China. They're like the same thing in Africa. Where is the, oh, the hand, the handprint in the cave. That's it. That's, that's it. A handprint, right? <laughs> and they got a handprint. And they're going to say, probably it's near. The, no, it ain't. It's the, it was the, those who came up out of there before they even got there because they could only put a hand up there. These other people were artistic. You didn't have that. You want to tell us people who, uh, you want to talk about uh, Michelangelo and all that. Man, there's probably some people that have been on this planet that could draw so good that you never got a chance to see them or their works. Right? But we're going to talk about some people that y'all talking about. We've been on the planet too damn long. I, that's just that's the funniest thing, too. Since we talking about yesterday was supposed to be uh, 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 Jesus' birthday, right? You tell me at that particular time, there was not one mug that could draw. Nobody could draw. We're going to wait till 1500 to 1600 for Michelangelo to draw in his vision in his mind of a person that existed he never saw, and that became your image. <laughs> Moving on. <laughs> Moving on, man. Moving. Moving on. All right, so I got one more, and I'm going to close the show out. I got one more. And this here is just a simple fact to bring some awareness to it. And there's actually an article on this, right? And uh, play this, and then I'm going to close out the show afterwards after they do the article. So check this out. I'll be right back. Captured on a mobile phone, these images show just a few of the migrants that the Algerian government has been dumping in the Sahara Desert. They are being left at the border because Algeria has expelled them. 
These are expelled migrants, and Algeria leaves them at point zero. They leave them at point zero, about 15 kilometers from Asamaka, and these migrants walk to Asamaka. Stranded without food or water, they're forced to walk to neighboring Niger. The International Organization for Migration says around 13,000 people have been expelled from the country this way in the past 14 months. The NGO estimates that for every migrant known to have died crossing the Mediterranean, as many as two are lost in the desert. They threw us in the middle of the desert. We were left there and we walked from eight in the morning until seven in the evening. We walked through the desert. There were around a thousand people in the desert walking. We lost our baby. Our baby was killed. Women were lying dead, men because there's no water, no food, starvation, children, kids and all. Other people got wounded, other people got missing in the desert because they didn't know the way. The Algerian government has denied criticism that it's committing rights abuses by abandoning migrants in the desert. The mass expulsions have picked up since October 2017, after the European Union renewed pressure on North African countries to deal with migrants heading north to Europe via the Mediterranean Sea. The city of Egedez used to rival Timbuktu as a center of commerce and learning. Now it's a revolving door for human traffickers and African migrants trying to reach Europe. But the passage is never easy. Situated in the far-flung northern desert of Niger, it's where the journey becomes untenable for these migrants. They often get stuck and run out of money. Ici therefore... I came here with a friend whose mother in Algeria sent him some money for transport. But we lost most of the money in bribes to policemen on the road. My friend has decided to continue the trip without me. And my family say they're not able to provide me any help. My parents are farmers who couldn't continue to pay for my education. And when I failed to find a job in Bamako, I decided to go to Europe, not to do any harm there, but just to work and live in peace. I may not fare better than those who died en route, as I may not fare worse than those who survived. But Nasser and Siseko are perhaps luckier than thousands who, after having reached Libya and Algeria, draining their energy and funds, were then forced to return to Agadez, a journey of more than 2,000 kilometers. For several months now, Algeria has been sending hundreds of migrants back to Niger, according to Human Rights Watch. Some of them say they went through extreme phases of suffering on the road due to exhaustion and malnutrition. What the Algerians did to us, I can't even talk about it. It's beyond explanation. The Algerians mistreated us. They beat people. People died. Two people died and they took our goods and money. Migrants are hosted in basic shelters before they are sent to their respective countries of origin. We conducted a census and received over 500 migrants who were kicked out from Algeria. Amongst them were 11 women and 19 children. We have welcomed them, offered shelter and food. Niger is a part of a multinational program sponsored by the EU, aimed at curbing African migration to Western Europe. Earlier this month, the EU offered 638 million euros to Niger to help deal with the rising tide of immigrants crossing the country. But as instability and drought continue to afflict the Sahel region, thousands of youths continue to brave the odds in search of a better life. Mohamed Vahid, Al Jazeera. Your skin color was a crime. African migrants in Algeria. You know I'm going to say that again. Your skin color was a crime. African migrants in Algeria. This story was done December the 24th, 2018 in Al Jazeera. And this is how it reads. In 1991, Michael George Johnson was 11 years old when he left his country for the first time. Both his parents were killed months earlier in one of the post-independence Africa's worst instances of bloodshed, the Liberian Civil War. Johnson spent the following 27 years searching for a safe place to settle down and trying to leave the ghosts of the conflict behind. Until one day at the beginning of October, he set foot in Niger, having survived a week-long forced trip through the Algerian desert. 
We've been gathered in buses, traveling from town to town without food, obliged to walk from 30 kilometers in the Sahara with a gun to our heads and packed like animals in a truck until we reach al -Gadiz, he recalled. The convoy carried a total of 279 people, rounded up in police operations all over Algeria. There were Cameroonians, Ivorians, Guineans, Nigerian women and children. We saw everything there, he added. Johnson Force Trip was one among dozens of mass explosions of migrants organized by Algerian authorities in 2018, attracting international criticism over the country's treatment of sub-Saharan citizens, often abandoned in the desert hours away from the closest border post in Niger. Terrible year. 2018 has been a terrible year for migrants working in Algeria, marked by the biggest number of arrests and deportations ever, human rights activist Faoud Hassoum told Al Jazeera. A member of the Algerian League to Defend Human Rights, Hassam assists some migrant workers in the city of Oran, has hometown in Northwood, Algeria, and has received threats from his work. Civil society actors and NGOs have been attacked for defending migrants, he said, over the phone. But this is only a part of the collective paranoia that rules our country. Activists, bloggers, journalists, unionists, and artists are seen and as a menace and migrants as well. One of the first explosions of migrants, he explained, was triggered by a fight between some sub-Saharan workers and locals in the suburbs of Algeria two years ago. Security forces arrest 1,500 sub-Saharan deportings, hundreds to borders with Niger. From the moment on things only got worse, your skin color was a crime, Hassam said. No matter what your legal status, you could be locked up and deported anytime only for being black. Johnson said he experienced that persecution firsthand. I knew that Algeria was unsafe, he recounts. But after endless travel, I could finally work as daily labor and construction sites, earning something to fulfill my dreams, which is to reach France. Journey through hell. In the previous years, Johnson lived in Mauritania, the Ivory Coast, and Sudan, where he tried unsuccessfully to cross the Red Sea to Saudi Arabia. He headed to Algeria after a dramatic passage through Libya, where he was detained and tortured by armed men. In Algeria, I had to hide, but at least there was some work. He said his European dream was interrupted abruptly one night in Algeria. On our way back from work, the police took all the blacks to the barracks. They didn't check our documents, and the next morning they threw us in a bus. Those asking to go home to collect their things were beaten hard. Johnson said it was a journey through hell. He and his companions were insulted and beaten at every stop. They told us it was punishment for being in the country and that we never have to come back, he said. During one of the stops of his convoy, he said a Liberian woman was raped and turned by three agents inside a police facility and forced to dance naked in front of them. One man died of internal bleeding after being kicked all over his body. We buried him with our own hands in the desert, he says, his voice trembling as he recalls those moments. George Oldman Harris, another Libyan who made his same journey a few weeks before him, shakes his head as Johnson speaks. I know very well what it is like, he said. Uh, Algerian deported me five times since I entered the country in 2013. The two met in al and decided to reach Naimi with a common purpose, making some money in order to avoid going back to Liberia empty-handed. Like hundreds of other You cut my mic off again. <laughs> you cut my mic off again. Transit centers offered by the Inter International Organization for Migration are packed with people demanding to return to their home countries through the UN agency volunteer return programs. As pushback continues, we're submerged by request, but we can't open a new center overnight, and IOM officials told Al Jazeera. 
These summary explosions are justified by referring to a 2014 agreement between Algeria and Niger, but in reality, we are facing enormous violations of international norms and human rights. Amnesty International Research Deborah Del Pisoya said, according to the note sent to Al Jazeera by Niger Interior Minister Mohamed Bazoum, the 2014 document was a declaration of intent and not a formal pact. Its aim, the note says, was to restrict cases for pushback to Niger and Nigerians who were forced into begging in Algeria's cities. But among the deportees, there are refugees and asylum seekers registered in Algeria and people from all over the West Africa who were detained and deported illegally, says Deporah. Amnesty International Campaign Force to Leave launched on December 20th calls on Algerian authorities, their partners, to immediately stop these practices and avoid any form of racial profiling. As for a comment by Al Jazeera, the Algerian interior minister didn't respond. However, during a conference of global migration early this month in Morocco, the boy said Algeria respects the right and dignity of its migrants. Algeria went through a huge and continuous arrival of migrants and had to take measures to reduce it. According to Del Pispora, statements by top Algerian officials such as Prime Minister Ahmed in July of 2017, that migrants were a source of criminality, drug, and other plagues, continued to a climax of xenophobia, where black migrants became the scapegoat for Algerian internal problems. Data collected by Amnesty International shows a sharp increase in collective exposure from Algeria to Niger from 1,340 people in 2014 to 9,300 in 2017 to 26,000 in 2018. 40% of were abandoned in the Sahara and forced to walk for hours to reach Asamaka, Nigeria's first border post. Mom people expelled to Niger in 2018. Okay, now, something going on over there, right? This is not, this is not the normal news over here. We don't know what's going on over there unless somebody actually reporting on it, right? Now, again, I know we got our issues over here. We got our problems over here. But, again, as we know that everybody's divvying up. So, again, as I said, if you take that map that they got out there, that one day, I'll, I'll, maybe next time I'll try today, later, hopefully. Uh, the map, how they take Asia, fit it in Africa, Europe to fit up in Africa, right? So, like, the question becomes, what happens to the Africans? As you heard in the story, the, the, the individual was talking about how he's trying to get into Europe. He's trying to get into France. He was trying to get into, he was anywhere but not in Africa. Right? So there's something going on that people are being forced out of and being migrants, migration out of and going into other territories. And again, they had to keep moving on. Right? So, you know, things are happening. Right? And you know, that's not supposed to be part of the kind of talk over here because, again, we got our own issues. But, again, as I said, the richest, most resourceful place on the continent but can't control it. Being conned out of it. Being bought out of it. And the deals that were made, well, who going to be the beneficiaries of that when they come to collect the debt and when they want to claim the land? Oh, we're seeing the migrations now. Well, it starts to be continued as it go on, right? Okay, I want to thank everybody who came here tonight, right? Or today, rather. And uh, sat and listened to a brother do a little show. Let me look out here before I get out here. It says, uh, no sound, they jiggling the wires. The last video of them, the last video of them came all around the world. Same song, right? Oh, okay. The last video of them. Oh, okay. You want me to play that again? Because, like I said, all around the world is the same song, right? I have to say that because, again, that's what it is. Everybody want to act like, you know, things ain't happening, but things are happening. And, again, you know, this this is it's, it's a global thing. Now, again, like I said, if somebody else gets to get the possession of the most resourceful, then everybody's at they, you know what I'm saying? Everybody going to be at their mercy. They're going to make it where your ass can't, you, you again, they're going to be able to control everything. So I guess all that Franken food will be given to everybody else. And they're going to get all the real shit, right? All right. So, okay, y'all, again, I'm going to tell everybody, thank you, everybody for coming out. Hope you, you hit that like button, subscribe button. And um, 
you know, hopefully I, I'm, I'm, I got to get out of here now so that I can try to get on for this next show tonight. I didn't want to tip my hand to the agents because I know they're going to be there, right? So, but anyway, I'm going to try to get it off. Hopefully, it don't stop me from getting on. You see, I, I'm talking about mic and stuff. Don't make no sense. Mic cutting off like that in the middle like that. Ain't nothing wrong with my damn mic. But anyway, y'all stay black. With love, see one another. Get a universal night. What's good, sister? And all that good stuff. You know what I'm saying? John Henry Clark and Charlie. The only thing we got is us. We ain't got nobody else, y'all. It's only us. Everybody out to get something from us or take something from us, right? Make make the money from us. So we got to learn how to do our things for ourselves, do what we can while we in with the position we in and trying to make the best of it. Again, certain things will never be spoken in the direct, but again, as time go on, I guess things will be made, well, I guess the moves will have to be made. So until then, stay black, love, peace of soul, love and hair grease and watermelon, chicken and all that.